Hello everyone, it is my pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Lauren Heinecke and I'm an assistant professor of pharmacotherapy at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. And today I'm excited to talk with you about the second in our series on antibiotics from head to toe. Specifically today we're going to be talking about acute otitis media. By the end of our time together, you should be able to list the most common organisms seen in acute otitis media. You should be able to identify the common signs and symptoms of acute otitis media. Certainly, it's important to understand how to select empiric therapy, and we're going to specifically delve into what antibiotics might be beneficial in a patient who has failed first-line therapy with amoxicillin. And then finally, I think one of the most important things we can talk about relative to infectious diseases is prevention. So specifically, we'll focus on the importance of immunizations in the prevention of acute otitis media. So before we delve into some numbers and talk a little bit about the epidemiology of acute otitis media, I thought we'd just start out with a, a couple of definitions, because I think one of the, the things that gets confusing with acute otitis media is all the different terminology and things that people talk about relative to acute otitis media. So really, otitis media has three subtypes, acute otitis media, otitis media with effusion, and chronic otitis media. So otitis media itself is inflammation of the middle ear. Acute otitis media, which is essentially what we're going to spend the rest of our time focusing on today, and is specifically the subtype of otitis media that benefits from antibiotic therapy, is an acute illness that's marked by the presence of middle ear fluid and inflammation of the mucosa that lines the middle ear space. Now, patients can have middle ear fluid without having acute otitis media, and when there's presence of that middle ear fluid, this is known as an effusion. So patients can have otitis media with an effusion. Essentially, this is the presence of that middle ear fluid without acute signs of illness or inflammation of the middle ear mucosa. And finally, chronic otitis media is really a long-term problem within the middle ear. To help everyone understand how important this topic is when we talk about antibiotics is this is the most common condition for which antibiotics are prescribed for children in the United States. So I think we would be remiss if we didn't do a series on antibiotics and not talk about acute otitis media. In terms of the number of visits to the ER as well as PCP, it ranks among both the 11th for ER visits and the 15th for PCP visits and accounts for about 15 million ER and PCP visits annually, which is a, a huge number of visits, and we all know really how crunched for time our, our PCPs are these days. I think the other important thing to consider is who is most likely to get an episode of acute otitis media. So acute otitis media is relatively uncommon in the first six months of life. This is because infants in this age group actually still have maternal antibodies that they've acquired uh, as they were growing in their, their mother's womb. So the time period when acute otitis media is most common is between 9 and 15 months of age. And about 75% of infants will have an episode of acute otitis media within their first year of life. Interestingly enough, 80% of infants and children that are seen for acute otitis media will receive a prescription for an antibiotic, and the direct and indirect costs associated with acute otitis media are estimated to be about $3 billion annually. So we're talking about relatively large numbers and a lot of antibiotic exposure. It's the number one reason that children are exposed to antibiotics in the United States. So, of course, when we talk about the etiology, you would expect that the majority of causes would be as a result of a bacterial infection. Well, you'll notice that number one on our list of etiologies is actually viral pathogens. So about 40 to 75 percent of our acute otitis media is not caused by something that will be cured using an antibiotic. However, we do have relatively high rates of both streptococcus pneumoniae as well as non-typable haemophilus influenza and a relatively smaller number of ear infections that are caused by Marexella cataralis. So in some of the, the shift in specifically what, what items we're seeing from an etiology standpoint has been as a direct result of immunization. So non-typable H flu is what we see now because of the Hib vaccine, um, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. We see we've seen a shift in terms of the serotypes that that are causing it as a result of our vaccination.
I think the next important thing to talk about now that we have an understanding of the numbers of people that are affected by acute otitis media, as well as what, what pathogens are causing acute otitis media, just to take a brief step back and to talk about why infants and children are so much more susceptible to acute otitis media than adults are. So I think the first important concept to understand is that the majority of cases of acute otitis media, as well as otitis media with an effusion, are actually preceded by a viral upper respiratory tract infection. Probably somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of cases actually you first see that viral upper respiratory tract infection first. And part of the reason for this is that the upper respiratory infection actually leads to a dysfunction in the eustachian tube. So it's not as effective uh, as a barrier between the, the external world and the middle ear in terms of preventing um, bacteria from causing an infection. So I think the other important piece of this is just taking a look specifically at the eustachian tube in infants versus adults. So you'll notice that in infants, the eustachian tube is much flatter, whereas in, uh, with adults, it's, it's much less horizontal. There's much more of a gradient in terms of the way bacteria would travel in between the external ear and the, the middle ear. And so just as a result of this this flattening more horizontal eustachian tube in our infants and children, bacteria are much more easily able to gain access to the middle ear. So it all has to do with the eustachian tube when we talk about pathophysiology and why our infants and children are more susceptible to these infections than our adults are. We next will talk about the clinical presentation, and many of these items probably will seem like pretty easy and, and very things that you would expect for patients to present with when you think about an ear infection or acute otitis media. So oftentimes acute onset ear pain is something that you'll hear older children who are able to verbalize complain about. In children who are, are nonverbal or preverbal, otalgia or tugging on the ear, specifically more attention being paid to the ear is really what you'll hear parents go in and tell their pe pediatrician. You may also hear about the uh, infants and preverbal children being more irritable, have more difficulty sleeping. Fever can be very common, and otorrhea or a discharge coming from the ear is also very common, and one of the things that we're going to be using when we talk about the diagnosis. So now that we have some understanding of the way patients are going to presenting clinically, let's take a look at how our pediatricians are going to be diagnosing acute otitis media. So unfortunately with acute otitis media, there is no gold standard for diagnosis. I think one of the problems with diagnosing acute otitis media is that the evaluation of the tympanic membrane can be relatively subjective. And so the otoscopic evaluation is still the really the, the tool that people are going to be using to diagnose uh, acute otitis media, but studies that have taken a look to try to elucidate some additional grading systems to better be able to classify which patients have acute otitis media which with uh, relative to which ones do not, ha haven't really panned out. What they found in these studies that have also sought to identify relationships between the otoscopic findings in tympanocentesis or actually culturing that fluid that's in the middle ear is that what is most sensitive and specific is the moderate to severe bulging of the tympanic membrane as well as patients who have otorrhea. So they also found intense erythema to be beneficial as well. If there was mild or moderate erythema, that didn't really correlate very well with whether or not the patient had acute otitis media or not in terms of the tympanocentesis finding. So the diagnosis probably will never be 100% clearly black and white, at least not right now. Um, but the, the guidelines have changed just slightly. So the American Academy of Pediatrics updated their guidelines in February of this year. Prior to that, they had been published in 2004. And in 2004, to make a diagnosis, the patient had to have an acute onset. They had to have a middle ear effusion as well as presence of inflammation. This has changed just slightly, and now they're saying that the diagnosis of acute otitis media should be made in a patient who has an acute onset of otorrhea that's not found to be due to acute otitis externa. If the patient has moderate to severe bulging of the tympanic membrane, this is going to be consistent with the diagnosis of acute otitis media. 
And finally, if they have bulging, mild bulging of the tympanic membrane and recent, so within the last 48 hours, onset of ear pain or intense erythema of the tympanic membrane, this is also a patient where it would be appropriate to diagnose them with an acute otitis media. I think one of the things that's probably helpful just to put this into perspective for everybody is to show you some otoscope findings. And these are some findings that they actually present in the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines. And they're actually free to anyone. So the citation that you see referenced down there would be free if you hopped on your computer. Uh, you would be able to take a closer look at those guidelines if there's anything that I don't go into enough detail for, for your specific practice. So. On the left-hand side, you have a normal tympanic membrane. In the next picture to your right, you have mild bulging, and the bulging really has to do with the amount of fluid that's in that middle ear. And you can see that this looks, this looks slightly more erythematous to me, but really has mild bulging. The moderate bulging then is seen in that, the third picture to your right, and severe bulging is in the far right-hand side uh, image. So I think this just helps to give you some slight understanding of the difficulty I think pediatricians have in terms of determining the severity. It's a very subjective evaluation. And so I think that's one of the, the difficulties in making this diagnosis and why when we get into talking about treatment, we'll talk about why maybe watchful waiting is okay. You know, one of the other reasons that watchful waiting is okay is the majority of these ear infections, even if they are bacterial, bacterial are self-limiting. There are very few adverse uh, effects associated with waiting and not treating immediately. And many, uh, many children actually can clear these infections on their own without using antibiotics. So we've got a lot of really great foundational knowledge under our belt in terms of talking about acute otitis media. Now's the time when we're going to specifically move into talking about our treatment options for our children with acute otitis media. So I first want to talk about the general approach. I think that the first part of this is determining the subtype of otitis media, and I think I've alluded to this a bit in our previous discussion, but the most important aspect is really differentiating between a child who has acute otitis media and a child who just has an effusion um, and someone who might have just an external ear infection. So I think that's really the first part of that and probably many of us are not going to be playing a large part in determining the subtype, but it's a really important part of, of making sure that we're exposing the, the right patients, I think, to antibiotics. The second part of this is addressing pain. So acute otitis media can be very painful, and unfortunately antibiotic therapy, even if it is prescribed, really doesn't help with the pain within at least the first 24 hours. Sometimes it doesn't even help within um, the first three to seven days. So pain management is really an important part of this, adequately uh, addressing the, the child or infant's pain. The third part of this is evaluating the need for antibiotic therapy versus using a brief observation period. I think the most important part about talking about these brief observation periods is there needs to be a mechanism for follow-up. And there's several different strategies that have been talked about in the literature in terms of what should be done when it's determined that it would be appropriate to use a brief observation uh, period. So we've talked about how the pain management is a huge part of this, and, and really the pain can be pretty substantial within the first few days. And in fact, it actually tends to persist longer in younger children. We've talked about the fact that our antibiotic therapy, even, as it, even if it is prescribed, doesn't provide any symptomatic relief, at least initially. And so our best options and really our mainstays of therapy for our pain management are going to be either acetaminophen or ibuprofen if you have a child who's six months or older. I have the dosing, dosing listed up there for you, um, as well as the maximum that you'd want to administer within a 24-hour period. There have been some publications looking at topical agents, specifically benzocaine and lidocaine, and really these agents have not shown to be very beneficial 
above and beyond the acetaminophen and the, and the ibuprofen. They may be beneficial within the first 30 minutes. Uh, and the other sort of piece of this is that the topical agents really shouldn't be used in children who are under five years of age. So you're going to have a very small patient population um, and I'm not sure that the topical agents really are worth the cost. They really have not been shown to be hugely beneficial in pain management. So I have them listed up there because they are included in the guidelines, but again, your mainstays for pain management really will involve both acetaminophen as well as ibuprofen. Once we have our patient's pain under control, we can talk a bit more about whether or not it's appropriate to use antibiotics versus observation. And so this chart looks rather busy here, uh, but based on their age and their specific signs and symptoms, as well as physical examination, taking a look at that tympanic membrane uh, is how you determine if you would use antibiotic therapy or if you could potentially think about um, observation. And I think the most important thing to, to think about with this antibiotic therapy versus observation, or what are the risks if you would opt for the observation? The two big important disease states that acute otitis media could potentially lead to are mastoiditis as well as meningitis. Now, the instances of this occurring are really very rare. However, I think it is important to point out that there was a study that took a look at the pre-antibiotic era, and they have estimated that in the post-antibiotic era that about 50% of cases of mastoiditis are prevented by antibiotics being used to treat acute otitis media. That being said, it has been estimated that you have a very high number needed to treat. So you'd need about 4,800 patients, so almost 5,000 patients treated with antibiotics to prevent one case of mastoiditis. So, you know, I think that really sort of puts it into perspective. Yes, antibiotics can prevent the development of mastoiditis as well as meningitis, but the risk of an acute otitis media developing into a mastoiditis or a meningitis are really very rare. And so this is, this is, I think, a part of the discussion about observation versus antibiotics. Okay, so taking a closer look at our table here, just to orient you to the table, the far left-hand side takes a look at, at age, and so essentially we're taking a look at six months to two years as compared to our older children who are over the age of two. And then we're taking a look at their diagnosis. So do they have otorrhea with an acute otitis median? Again, remembering our acute otitis media is really being defined by the tympanic membrane findings or the uh, otoscope findings that we discussed previously on the diagnosis slide. Does the patient have a unilateral or bilateral acute otitis media with severe symptoms? And on the next slide, we'll talk about what is defined as severe symptoms. Does the patient have bilateral acute otitis media without otorrhea. And so the AOM, if I haven't defined it prior to, to now, it, it made it a bit easier to, to make these tables smaller and a bit more easier to read. AOM is acute otitis media. And then the last classification that we'd be talking about is unilateral acute otitis media without otorrhea. So in our younger age group, six months to two years, we're talking about using antibiotic therapy in all but our patients who have a unilateral acute otitis media without otorrhea. And so antibiotic therapy could be used or you could use an additional observation strategy. In our uh, children who are over the age of two, antibiotic therapy is recommended for our otorrhea with acute otitis media or in our patients who have more severe symptoms. Bilateral acute otitis media without otorrhea or unilateral acute otitis media without otorrhea, we could either use antibiotics or we could use that additional observation strategy. And so I think the important point here as well is just to talk about what does it mean to have that observation strategy. So the observation strategy is basically the parent observes the child or the infant for the next 48 to 72 hours. You're essentially looking for signs and symptoms to be getting better or at least to not be getting worse. So hopefully getting better, not getting worse. If they are not better at 48 to 72 hours or they are getting worse, at this point in time it would be pertinent to get back in touch with the clinician or pediatrician. And at that point, you would start the, the child or infant on antibiotics. Or depending on how severe the symptoms were, it may be pertinent to get them back into the office to evaluate them. There have also been studies in the literature that have taken a look at 
essentially using this observation strategy, but providing the parent or caregiver with a prescription so that at 48 to 72 hours, if things are not better or they're worse, they could just fill that prescription. So there's a couple of different strategies, but I think the key piece of this is you need to have somebody reliably evaluating the child. You need to be able to get back in touch with the pediatrician if necessary, and it needs to be quick and easy to be able to get a hold of antibiotics if they're necessary. So when they talk about the observation period, period in the guidelines, one of the things that they talk about in terms of determining whether antibiotic therapy or an observation period is going to be recommended is really on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's a discussion with the parent or caregiver to make the decision based on the risk of not treating versus the risk of treating. And certainly giving a child antibiotics who doesn't need them can result in some significant adverse events. I'm thinking most frequently uh, diarrhea would be the, the sign and symptom that you, or adverse drug event that you would, would see. And, you know, then you, you really need to have somebody who, as we've talked about, really meets all those, those other items, able to get antibiotics quickly, able to observe the child and reliably observe the child, and able to get back in touch with the pediatrician if necessary. So all of those things would be part of the conversation with the parent or care caregiver when determining for the, the patients who would qualify potentially for observation, whether they want to go with antibiotic therapy or whether they want to go with the observation strategy first. Okay, so on the previous slide, we, we talked about whether somebody had severe or non-severe illness, and this really hasn't changed since the 2004 guidelines. So non-severe illness really is defined as mild otalgia and a fever that's less than 39 degrees Celsius. A severe illness is going to have um, more significant pain, so moderate to severe otalgia, and a fever greater than 39 degrees Celsius. So this helps us to define who are going to be our really non-severe illness patients versus our severe illness patients, and it's going to help us to, to categorize them in terms of whether or not we'd want to absolutely give antibiotic therapy right off the bat or whether we might feel comfortable using that observation strategy. So in addition to talking about which patients might be appropriate in terms of thinking about observation, I think it's important to take a look at the outcome. So was there any difference in patients who are treated with antibiotics versus observation? And so there have been studies that have been done taking a look at patients treated with antibiotics versus the observation strategy. And in the 2004 guidelines, I think they did a really nice job of highlighting this data. In the new 2013 guidelines, I don't think they've done as great of a job highlighting this. So this table is some of the data that was included in the 2004 guidelines. So to orient you to the table, on the left-hand side, you have the various outcomes. After that, the following column is in the antibiotic therapy. The subsequent column is up the observation group. And then the last column is the p-value comparing the two. So the first outcome is symptomatic relief at 24 hours. And we've already really talked about the fact that we need to be using pain management as opposed to our antibiotics, knowing that our antibiotics really are not going to help with symptomatic relief in the first 24 hours. So not surprisingly, there's not a difference between our antibiotic therapy versus our observation group. In terms of clinical resolution at 7 to 14 days in our antibiotic therapy group, 82% had clinical resolution, 72% in our observation group, and again, this is not statistically significant. In terms of pain duration, the mean days in our antibiotic group compared to our observation group are 2.8 and 3.3 days respectively. Again, not a statistically significant difference between the two. Really not much of a clinically significant difference if you ask me. We're talking about maybe a half of a day in terms of the, the difference. In terms of analgesic use, the mean doses is slightly lower in our antibiotic therapy group, 2.3 versus 4.4, and this value is statistically significant. Fever duration is, is also statistically significant, only lasting about two days in our antibiotic therapy group, where it, it was uh, more like three days in our observation period of group. I've already sort of discussed incidents of mastoiditis or other potential complications, including things like meningitis. And again, the incidence of these complications is very low. There was no difference in our antibiotic therapy treated group as compared to observation. And then the last piece of this is thinking about what kind of harm are we doing by giving our, our 
infants and children these antibiotics, so maybe they don't need to be exposed to them. And so they've included antibacterial agent-induced diarrhea or vomiting, recognizing that our GI complications are going to be our most common adverse events with the antibiotics that we're using. And in our antibiotic therapy group, it was 16%. There was no comparator group in this particular study, but I think it is important to point out that, that these are not benign therapies. So I think that this slide is indicated not to, to make you think about using observation more because I think there is a role for antibiotics, but I think in the correct patients based on what our, our guidelines have sort of recommended, we can feel, I think, reasonably comfortable using that observation strategy as long as we have, as I've already discussed, a mechanism for close follow-up within 48 to 72 hours and we feel comfortable that we have somebody who could accurately and, and easily assess the patient in those 48 to 72 hours and to get back in touch with the pediatrician or other clinician if symptoms worsen or there's no improvement. So I think if you have those things in place, this, this data really helps you feel a little bit more comfortable with that observation period as opposed to, to treating with antibiotics right off the bat. We've talked a lot about observation as compared to antibiotics. So just what antibiotics are we going to use empirically in the treatment of acute otitis media? There has been some debate in the literature about used, continuing to use amoxicillin as first-line therapy as opposed to going to amoxicillin clavulonic acid. And the main reason for this is that there's been increasing amounts of, of pathogen resistance to amoxicillin. However, the guidelines and the American Academy of Pediatrics really still felt like high-dose amoxicillin should be recommended first line because of, it, of its general effectiveness. And when it's used in sufficient doses, so that high dose, 80 to 90 mg per keg per day in divided doses, it actually is able to, to treat both susceptible and intermediate strep pneumo. It is a relative, very safe medication. It's low cost. It has a relatively acceptable taste, which is certainly an important part of selecting therapy in our pediatric population. And it has a narrow microbiologic spectrum. So we're not talking about, um, you know, wiping out huge amounts of, of bacteria leading to C. diff. And we're, we're talking about not inducing a lot of resistance, certainly when we talk about the, the risk of, of multidrug resistant bugs. Certainly the, the more broad spectrum I think we use, the, the higher the risk for, for more multidrug resistant stuff in the future. So the first line recommendation at initial diagnosis is either high dose amoxicillin or high dose amoxicillin clavulonate. And where you would consider using the high dose amoxicillin clavulonate over just plain amoxicillin is in your patients who have received amoxicillin really within the last 30 days, so somebody who would be at higher risk to have a drug-resistant bug right up front. Now, if you want, needed an alternative agent because of um, penicillin allergy or they had been on amoxicillin clavulonate or amoxicillin recently within the last 30 days, you could consider using ceftonir, cefuroxime, cefpodoxime, or ceftriaxone. Now, in thinking about the differences between these, the American Academy of Pediatrics does include ceftonir in there. I would probably select something like cefuroxime or cefpodoxime before I would uh, select ceftonir because ceftonir is uh, a relatively weaker drug in terms of its, its ability to cover strep pneumo. So ceftonir wouldn't be my first choice, although it is listed in the guidelines as an alternative therapy. Now, if you had failure at 48 to 72 hours, so the symptoms had not improved or they had actually worsened, if you were going with your first-line therapy, the recommendation would be for amoxicillin clavulonate if the patient had first received amoxicillin, or if they had initially received amoxicillin clavulonate, you would now go to a ceftriaxone um, therapy, and the ceftriaxone would be administered intramuscularly or intravenously. Uh, alternatives, if you have a, uh, an issue with allergies, you could consider using clindamycin. While we're on this slide, I think one important item to point out is that in the past, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and erythromycin have been used. The important thing to point out with these agents is that pneumococcal surveillance really has shown that there's significant resistance to these two agents. And so trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and erythromycin erythromycin sulfasoxazole would no longer be recommended as empiric therapy for the treatment of acute otitis media.
I think because we're talking about a pediatric disease, I would be remiss if I didn't include some antibiotic dosing. And so all of the agents that I have listed in your empiric antibiotic table, I have dosing listed for you. You'll note that the amoxicillin and the amoxicillin clavulani are the higher dosing. Um, and you will note that the majority of these agents need to be divided into at least, least two divided doses, which I think is, is an important part of, of the tolerability of these agents. Now that we have an idea about what empiric antibiotics that we are going to use when we've decided that antibiotic use is appropriate for our patient, the next part of this is determining how long do they need to be treated. The problem with duration, many of our, our discussions about duration and, and antibiotics, is there's really not definitive data. So the standard duration for the treatment of acute otitis media is 10 days. Now many of you may be saying, where did we get that 10 days, shouldn't we just you know, stick with it? Where did it come from? And the 10 days was actually derived from the duration of treatment for streptococcal pharyngotonsillitis. So not exactly acute otitis media, but that's essentially where our standard duration came from. I will tell you that shorter courses have been investigated and the time when the, the 10 days really seems to be necessary is in our younger uh, infants and toddlers. So in children under the age of two, using the standard course of 10 days is, is going to be most appropriate. In children who are between the ages of two and five, and they have mild or moderate acute otitis media, a seven-day shorter course of therapy has been shown to be just as good as doing the standard 10-day course. And as we get even older children with acute otitis media, children over the age of six, again, with a mild to moderate acute otitis media, an even shorter course, closer to five to seven days, is, is just as good as our standard 10-day therapy. So as we get older children with acute otitis media who have mild or moderate disease, using a shorter course of therapy is certainly appropriate. We do know that the, the less we expose people to antibiotics, the less adverse events they have, as well as the, the less drug, uh, drug resistance we are breeding. So certainly Talking about duration is important, but just know that we don't have a lot of fabulously definitive data for exactly what is the appropriate duration for acute, acute otitis media and many of our other disease states. It's also important to consider recurrent acute otitis media. So what do we do with those kids that are just continuing to get ear infection after ear infection? Um, and so how do we define recurrent acute otitis media, first of all? So a recurrent acute otitis media is three episodes of acute otitis media within six months or four episodes within 12 months. And if they have those four episodes within 12 months, they have to have at least one episode in the last six months. So I think the first piece of this is why is there a concern about recurrent otitis media? And the concern is that there's a high risk for hearing loss as well as language and learning disabilities in children under three years of age who do have recurrent otitis media. And certainly we know that increased exposure to antibiotics does lead to increased antibiotic resistance. So what are our options in terms of treating these patients? I think the one that um, is probably talked about maybe the most and is still controversial is the use of tympanostomy tubes or T-tubes. So this is a surgical intervention to help decrease the risk of recurrent otitis media. This is something that could be offered if there, there is found to be recurrent acute otitis media. The other potential thought is to do a tympanocentesis. So this is actually obtaining some of the fluid from the middle ear to see if it's infected, to see if there's some other process going on, to see if there's an issue with resistance. And if there is an issue with resistance, one of the, the things that's been talked about is some alternative therapy. So two of the medications that have been talked about in the guidelines for recurrent acute otitis media with issues in terms of resistance is the potential for using levofloxacin or linazolid, neither of which is approved for acute otitis media in pediatric patients. So levofloxacin and the fluoroquinolones there has been a lot of problems in terms of the safety in, in pediatric patients, and really it's an issue of, of cartilage development in pediatric patients. So the specific data in pediatrics is something that, again, we could probably spend a whole hour talking about, but most of the data actually is in infantile uh, animals, specifically beagle puppies. So I think the the Four quinolones are going to be something that we see more and more talked about and, and thought about in terms of our pediatric population. There have been several small trials 
using fluoroquinolones in pediatric patients with otitis media. The majority of the trials, I found three actually used gadifloxacin, um, and they didn't find any safety issues. Now, these were smaller studies, so they were not powered to find uh, any issues in terms of the the cartilage issues. And again, remember gadifloxacin was pulled from the market in 2006 because of hyperglycemia issues. I found one trial using levofloxacin. Again, it was a very small study, but levofloxacin is uh, potentially an option if we have issues with recurrent acute otitis median and maybe it's a resistance issue. So I think the, the, the big thing that the majority of people still talk about is the tympanostomy tubes and considering a tympanocentesis in terms of thinking about whether, you know, looking at whether there's something else going on or if there's issues with resistance. So the last piece of our discussion is talking about prevention. Certainly if we can prevent these kids from getting ear infections, that would be better overall, right? So I mentioned in our overview we were going to be talking about immunizations, and so the two big ones that really have been shown to decrease the, the number of acute otitis media infections are the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and the influenza vaccine. So with the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, there was a meta-analysis done that showed that when they pulled the data, there was a decrease of about 30% in acute otitis media caused by pneumococcal serotypes. That's a, a pretty good number. However, if you take a look at individual clinical trials, really the, the magnitude has been significantly less and really very modest with a decrease of only about 6 to 7% of the acute otitis media caused by pneumococcal serotypes. However, there have also then, on the flip side, been observational studies which have shown a decrease in about 40% in medical office visits for acute otitis media. So we've got lots of different numbers telling us that pneumococcal conjugate vaccine decreases acute otitis media. So we don't know exact, the exact number, and I think we've got lots of other things that could go into and really confound the data in terms of why we maybe see less medical office visits, but there is data to show that pneumococcal conjugate vaccine decreases rates of acute otitis media. And the data that we have currently is with our conjugate 7 vaccine. Remember that our conjugate 13 vaccine um, was approved, I believe it was in 2010. So we may see an even further reduction in acute otitis media as a result of the introduction of this conjugate vaccine that covers more serotypes. So stay tuned for additional data relative to the the conjugate 13 vaccine. In terms of our influenza vaccine, remember when we talked about our pathophysiology, we talked about most cases of acute otitis media actually follow an upper respiratory tract infection, and that includes influenza virus. So it's actually been estimated that as many as two-thirds of children with influenza have an acute otitis media. And so they've, many studies actually in the literature have demonstrated that there is a 30 to 55% efficacy of the influenza vaccine in preventing acute otitis media during the flu season. So I think this is a, the, another you know, robust piece of data to encourage parents to vaccinate their, their infants and their children against flu on, a, on a, an annual basis. And remember that influenza vaccine is recommended for all children six months of age and older. So you, those of you who, who know, um, know me have heard me talk about vaccines, so I can never resist a, a chance to get in a little bit of data that really is a plug for immunizing our children. The last piece of this that really has less robust study, uh, data and is not uh, an immunization is respiratory synctal virus immune globulin, or RSV. And there's very limited data on RSV immune globulin. Um, and there are very specific patients that would be candidates for RSV immune globulin. They're high risk to, to be infected with RSV. Some specific populations are those with congenital heart abnormalities as well as uh, certain premature infants. We're not going to specifically delve into who would be uh, receiving RSV immune globulin. There's also paluvizumab, which is used to, to prevent uh, RSV infection in these high-risk infants. Uh, and there has been some data that shows that RSV immune globulin does decrease the risk of acute otitis media. Again, RSV is a virus, so if someone was, uh, an infant was infected with RSV, uh, that would, again, qualify as an upper respiratory tract infection that then could predispose them to an acute otitis media infection. So potentially children who are, are high risk and would be receiving the RSV immune globulin would decrease their risk of having an acute otitis media. That data has not panned out for paluvizumab. And this is not a reason to give 
additional patient populations, the RSV immune globulin. So I pointed out to sort of be all-encompassing in talking about our prevention data, but it's not something that we're going to expand our use into because it is a very expensive product. And the last piece of prevention are, in addition to immunizations, there's some other items that have been shown to decrease the risk of acute otitis media. Breastfeeding for four to six months can uh, help in terms of preventing recurrent as well as episodes of acute otitis media. And this is really just that uh, breastfeeding is a way to transmit antibodies from the mother to the infant to help protect them against the, the pathogens that would increase their risk for acute otitis media. There has been shown that there is, is a risk of acute otitis media with exposure to passive tobacco smoke, so eliminating this exposure can help as well. The other two things that can help decrease the risk of acute otitis media is avoiding supine bottle feeding as well as eliminating uh, pacifier use early, two additional items that actually have been shown in the literature to increase the risk for acute otitis media. So I hope uh, everyone has gotten something out of that, has learned a little bit about acute otitis media and, and can take something forward from this presentation to, to take better care of our infants and our children.